8. Here, the very first thing we run into is the infamous story of the woman caught in adultery. One of the most famous accounts in the Bible. Um, and I, I think outside of John 3.16... The he is without sin cast the first stone is the most quoted passage in scripture. Um, well, if you start on the last verse of chapter 7 and go through verse 11 of chapter 8, the Amplified Bible says John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not found in the older manuscripts, but it sounds so like Christ that we accept it as authentic and feel that to omit it would be most unfortunate. Whatever. Okay? And I hate using that term. But whatever. <laughs> oh, they bring your girls a lot? Yeah. yeah. Makes the back of my hand hurt. Yeah. My kids had ever said. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the uh, Catholic translation, the New American Bible, it says, the story of the woman caught in adultery is a later insertion here, missing from all early Greek manuscripts. All. A Western text type insertion attested mainly in old Latin translations. It's found in different places in different manuscripts here or after chapter 7, verse 36, or at the end of this gospel, or after Luke 28, 31, or at the end of that gospel. There are many non yohanine features in the language, meaning non-John-like. This doesn't sound like something John wrote. There are also many doubtful readings within the passage. The style and the motifs are similar to those of Luke, and it fits better with the general situation at the end of Luke 21, but it was probably inserted here because of the allusion to Jeremiah 17, 13, and the statement, I don't judge anyone in, in uh Chapter 8, verse 15, the Catholic Church accepts this passage as canonical scripture. And as I mentioned here, well, of course it does. Why wouldn't they accept it as canonical scripture? Because they, they look at uh, what the popes have said as the same thing as scripture anyway. So why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't they go ahead and accept this? New American Standard says John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not found in most old manuscripts. In the New English Bible, it says the passage is omitted. Chapter 8 begins with verse 12. There's a footnote after verse 52. Some witnesses here insert the passage 753 to 811, which is printed on page 143. The complete passage is found at the end of the book of John on a page by itself. There's a footnote after the insertion. This passage, which in the most widely received editions of the New Testament, is printed in the text of John 753 to 811, has no fixed place in our witnesses. Some of them do not contain it at all. Others place it after Luke 21, 38. Others after John 7, 36, 52, or 21, 24. <clears throat> New International Version. The earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have this in there. It's not there. Revised Standard Version. The most ancient authorities omit 753 to 811. Other authorities add the passage here or in other places with variations of the text. You know what that means. Telling a different story in different places, in different manuscripts. <clears throat> Christianity Today website. Question is, is let he who is without sin cast the first stone biblical? And the answer is scholars are cautious about the story of the woman caught in adultery. When Dallas Theological Seminary professor Daniel Wallace examined New Testament manuscripts stored in the National Archive in Albania last June, he was amazed about what he did not find. The story of the woman caught in adultery, usually found in John 7, 53 to 8, 11, was missing from three of the texts, was out of place in a fourth, and tacked onto the end of John's Gospel. This is way out of proportion for manuscripts from the ninth century and following, Wallace said. Once we get into that era, the manuscripts start conforming much more to one another. Thus, to find some that don't have the story is remarkable. So he's saying about the 9th century A.D., this story actually started getting put in and copied away. Well, but then also, he said, uh, manuscripts aren't Remember when, when we talked about the 
that's uh, uh, been a shot how I hurry up and get it published. I want to be the first one. And all the yeah. Good. Yeah, well, then we'll start, start agreeing because if someone starts inserting it in the 9th century, well, all those 12th and 14th century documents, you know, now they've got it because it goes like this when you start copying it. <clears throat> Many scholars agree that the verses are not original to John's gospel, pointing out the story interrupts the flow of the verses that come before and after. The style is also noticeably different from that of John's usual writing. The note in most Bibles does not say the story isn't authentic, but that the oldest manuscripts do not include it. Lay people assume that translation teams must have a good reason for including the passage. Wallace said Douglas Moo, professor at Wheaton College, said that Christians should be cautious when using go and sin no more or let him who is without sin cast the first stone. I've never heard anyone hesitate to make those comments. Wallace said pastors have a responsibility to communicate the truth of this text to their congregations. <laughs> Inserted the joke there. <clears throat> we need to be as thoroughly biblical as we can be. There's a huge amount of ignorance that we're catering to in the Christian public. A person hearing these words should recognize that they have no authority as authentic words of Jesus, he said. Christians who are reading the story, he said, should give it the same authority as any other unsubstantiated early Christian teaching about Jesus. That comes from the Christianity Today website. <clears throat> and here's how it reads if you take that out. I'm going to read starting at John 7, verse 50, and I'm going to take you on through to uh, 8, verse 13. We read, Nicodemus said to them, he who came to him before being one of them. Remember when Nicodemus came to him? That was at night by himself, and he... Uh, he talked about uh, uh, a number of things, and this is where John 3.16 came from. And he told that to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus said, Our Torah does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered and said to him, You're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Again, therefore, Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you're bearing witness of yourself, your witness is not true. So, you know, we, here's the deal. We have the Pharisees, Nicodemus being one, and they're all talking about, the Pharisees are saying, no, he's a, he's a, he's a phony, he's from Galilee. Uh, the, the, the Messiah, uh, the, the son of David is not going to come from Galilee, he's going to come from Bethlehem. Uh, of course, he didn't come from Galilee. He, came, he was born in Bethlehem. And... <clears throat> Then Yeshua says, hey, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And the Pharisees said, you're just bearing your own witness. Now, if you take that story, the Pharisees are telling Nicodemus, you <clears throat> must be from Galilee also. Okay, and then uh, everybody leaves. They went back to their houses. It says at the end of verse 7. Then they came back the next day and they brought this woman that had been in adultery. They said caught in adultery. I don't know how you catch someone in adultery. I mean, do you window peep? These people doing this adultery, what's the penalty for adultery? Yeah. Death. Okay, so you're not going to do it the corner of Rogers Avenue and Waldron, right? That's death. So now how all these guys witnessed it, I have no idea. And they didn't bring the man. And they do this story with him, and then he writes in the sand. And then uh, he looks up, and they're all gone. And he says, where are, are all the witnesses? And she said, they're all gone. And he said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Okay? And then, after that, they, they leave, and then they come back again. And Yeshua says, I'm the light of the world. The Pharisees said, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. So if you insert that silly story in there, they're there, then they go home, then they come back, then they go home, then they come back, here we are. Or they're just having a conversation, and it never ended. With the Pharisees accusing him and him saying, uh, no, I'm the light of the world, and them saying, no, you're just bearing your own witness. Do you follow me? None of this going back, coming forth, going, going away, coming back, going away, coming back, going away, coming back. 
and picking up the conversation where it was three days ago or two days ago. <clears throat> so, you know, the other thing is, whoever inserted that passage, they said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. They didn't know the Torah. Whoever inserted it didn't know the Torah. So it was obviously a, a Catholic monk of some kind. Um, and we know that who's supposed to cast the first stone, by the way? The witnesses do. The witnesses do. <clears throat> and once again, I don't know how all these guys just happened to catch this woman in adultery. That one always mystified me. How'd you catch her? Also, if uh, Yeshua said, then I don't condemn you, go and sin no more, then he's breaking Torah. Because you're supposed to die, and the witnesses are yeah. the ones that's supposed Throw to the first. cast the first stone. Right. It's, it's just, a, okay, you, you want to know what it is, what happened was somebody wanted to alleviate their own guilt, don't want to be judged, and that's why they inserted it. Yeah, they didn't bring the man. Just brought the woman. Yeah, they just brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. It's supposed to be a, you know, I don't. I really don't think the woman committed adultery with herself. I don't think that's adultery. I shouldn't have said that. Every once in a while, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was my explanation early on until I found out it shouldn't even be there, and I'm wasting my time trying to explain it. <clears throat> Let's go back to John 8, verse 12. That's enough, Kathy. <laughs> Again, therefore, Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay, he says, I'm the light of the world. One of the definitions we have for Elohim is that he is light. In 1 John 1, 5, and this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that Elohim is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You see, he's totally light. There's no darkness in him whatsoever. Uh, Yeshua has just exposed the Pharisees and the scribes for the, uh, for the sin that they are, just like headlights in the face of a deer. So that's the thing about light. It eliminates darkness. And light, light is such an interesting thing. When you try to figure out what is light, that's a good question. The fact of the matter is we don't know that much about it. We know how to make it, but we don't know that much about it. It acts like waves in some instances, and it acts like particles in other instances. And they say, some say, well, it can't be both. And then others can say, well, yes, it can be both. But there have been amazing discoveries with light, with light looking at them as waves and also as looking at it with, as particles. So light is tough. We know how fast it is. It's very fast. <coughs> at least we know the speed of light at the present time here on Earth. We don't know much about it otherwise. We, we don't know much about light. We really don't know that much about it. But we do know we can't walk around without it. That's dangerous, isn't it? Yeah. You, will, you will break your nose walking around with that light. It's uh, just as physical light lets us know how to get around without injuring ourselves. Elohim shows us the way around in life also. He's the light for our lives. He our, he's, allows us to see the world and how to react to it. Now, Yeshua here, what he's doing in this passage, he's comparing himself to the pillar of fire that led the Israelites during the night in the wilderness. <clears throat> Remember that uh, his discourse that he gave during the Feast of Tabernacles, which points to the wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness? Yeshua is using this occasion to give us another object lesson that we can relate to. You Remember the, the things that he said about himself that everyone could relate to? He used very common things. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. Now he says he's the light. 
He uses these things to describe himself so they're things that we can relate to and understand. The Father uses this in his relationship with us to describe what our relationship with him should be. It should be like a marriage relationship. It should be like a parent-child relationship. He says, because he is our bread, he's our water, he's our light. In verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you're bearing witness of yourself, your witness is not true. So now they're trying to discredit Yeshua to say, well, you're just, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to bear witness of yourself, and that's just one witness, and that doesn't count. It does not establish a matter. And, you know, the Torah says that a matter is established by two or more witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 says, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he's committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Well, <clears throat> this does not say that one witness is false. That does not mean that. It means that one witness and a testimony of one witness does not establish a matter. The only way it could be confirmed is with two or more witnesses. Verses 14 through 16, Yeshua answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You people judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it, but I am, but I and he who sent me. <clears throat> Yeshua doesn't judge according to the flesh. He judges according to the way his father sees it. The Pharisees don't see it the way Elohim sees it. They see it differently. They judge themselves, they judge everyone according to their traditions of their sages. They have totally different perspectives. Okay, you can judge it from the way the father sees things or from the way the traditions of man see things. Verses 17 and 18, even in your Torah it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Now Yeshua is agreeing that two or more witnesses is, is how a, a matter is established. He's saying he gave witness of himself, and his Father did also. Have you noticed how John really tries to get this witness thing down? There's witnesses to this. John the Baptist, his name should be John the Witness, because that's why he was established. We read in uh, Mark 1, verses 9 through 11. And it came about in those days that Yeshua came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening, and the Spirit, like a dove, the breath, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, John had already uh, testified to the true identity of Yeshua. In John 1, verses 32 through 34, And John bore witness, saying, I beheld the breath descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the breath descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, in the set-apart breath. And I've seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of Elohim. So there's witnesses now. You see, you're testifying of yourself. Well, no, the Father testified. He spoke and testified. John witnessed that the Father spoke. I'm telling you the Father spoke. Verse 19, and so they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Yeshua answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Do you get a jab here? You see a jab at Yeshua? Uh, hmm, Who, where's your father again? <laughs> well, no, they're saying you don't have a father. That's what the Pharisees are saying. But what he says back. Yeah, what he says back is interesting, but... You see, this initially was a jab at Yeshua. Where is your father? Yeah, we've heard the rumor. 
But uh, this remarks about the virgin birth and about who his father really is. I believe that's what they were saying. They're throwing some low blows in the hopes of uh, discrediting him. That's their whole game plan anyway. Yeshua responds by saying they don't know his father. He says the only way that you can know the father is through me, is what he said. They could know the father through him because Yeshua is his father's word that became flesh and dwelt among us. To know him is to obey him and keep his word. And we'll read later on here in verse 55, And you've not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Verse 20 of John 8, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. One, they couldn't touch him until the right time came. That was very important. The appointed time set up by Elohim had, has not come yet. Verses 21 and 22, he said, therefore, again to, me, to them, I go away and you shall seek me and shall die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Therefore, the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. <clears throat> the Pharisees, they're, they're still, they're trying some low blows here. They're accusing Yeshua of wanting to commit suicide. <clears throat> They're trying to put words in his mouth and try to mock his actual words. Verses 23 and 24, And he was saying to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore to you, You shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. This is uh, really an I am declaration. He is not there. It's, it's been inserted. So I have it italicized there. <clears throat> uh, it appears that Yeshua is saying he's a manifestation of the I am from Exodus 3, 14. And Elohim said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 25. So they're saying to him, who are you? Yeshua said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. The words and judgments of Yeshua are according to the words of the Father who sent him. See, so they're not his own words. That's another thing It's very important for everyone to understand. His words are not his words. They're his Father's words. He really didn't say anything. Verses 27 and 28. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Yeshua therefore said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. So he does that I am thing again. Uh, the he, once again, is not there. He refers to himself as the Son of Man which is uh, to be exalted, by the way, and he says to be lifted up. That doesn't mean resurrected. He's saying the Son of Man should be exalted. When he calls himself the Son of Man, he does that because it's a vision that Daniel had. In Daniel 7, which we just went over a lot of that Wednesday night, verses 13 and 14, we read, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So he says, I'm the Son of Man. And look what it says about the Son of Man. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. What's the, what's the uh, gospel again? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he's referring to. Right here. <clears throat> Verse 29, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Yeshua said the Father has not left him alone because he always does the, th the things that please him. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, behold, my servant 
whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul, my soul delights. I put my breath upon him, he will bring forth justice to the nations. And verse, skipping down to verse 21, Yahweh was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the Torah great and glorious. Verses 30 and 31. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Yeshua, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Yeshua says that if we abide in his word, then we are truly his disciples or his pupils. In uh, 1 Samuel 12, verses 14 and 15, If you fear Yahweh and serve him, and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of Yahweh, then you and also the king who reigns over you will follow Yahweh your Elohim. And if you will not listen to the voice of Yahweh, but rebel against the command of Yahweh, then the hand of Yahweh will be against you as it was against your fathers. Verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Everyone loves that verse. <clears throat> Yeshua says, if you abide in his word, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What? is truth. Remember, Pilate asked that question a little bit later on in John. What is truth? Well, I, I, Scripture will tell us what truth is. Psalm 119, verse 43. And do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. Verse 45. And I will walk at liberty. I will walk at freedom. I will I'll walk as I'm set free, for I seek your precepts. Verse 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is truth. Verse 151, you are near, O Yahweh, and all your commandments are truth. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Verse 160. And we're going to read this one again. We read it earlier today, James um, 1, verse 25. The one who looks intently at the perfect Torah, the Torah of liberty. What was that one we just read here? For I walk at liberty because I seek your precepts. But the one who looks intently at the perfect Torah, the Torah of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. Going back to John 8, verse 33. So that's what sets you free, is his Torah is what sets you free. That's it. Verse 33, they answered him, we're Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you shall become free? You know, the, the Pharisees will resort to blatant lies in order to discredit Yeshua. Uh, the sons of Abraham were held in bondage by Egypt, Persia, Greece, and now they're under the oppression of Rome. Okay, they're not free. They were not free at that time. But Yeshua was speaking about them being enslaved to their sin, and that's what the problem was. Verses 34 and 35, Yeshua answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. <clears throat> you know, the, the fact that sin will enslave us is not a new concept. It's spoken of in the Tanakh fairly often. Proverbs 5.32, his own iniquities will capture the, wick, the wicked and he'll be held with the cords of his sin. Psalm 7 verses 15 and 16, he's dug a pit and hollowed it out and has fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head and his violence will descend upon his own pate. Yeshua said the slave of sin does not remain in the house forever. He's saying the Pharisees are slaves to sin and they won't be a part of the house of Israel very, for very long. <laughs> Paid his head. Head. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, they were expelled from the land in 70 AD, excuse me, by the Roman Empire. Verse 36, if therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We're free through Yeshua Messiah because of him sending the breath of the Father. 
Yeshua made this, makes this clear when he, uh, with what he read in the temple. In Luke 4, verses uh, 17 and 18. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him, and he said, began to say to them, Today this scripture has been made full in your hearing. <clears throat> Verses 37 and 38. I know you're Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I've seen with my father, Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. You know, he, he says, uh, if you were really Abraham's descendants, you wouldn't want to kill me. Yeshua only speaks these things he's seen from the father. Likewise, they only do things that they see from their father. The Pharisees can't comprehend the things of Elohim because he's not their father. They don't know each other. The Pharisees want to do the desire of their father, which is Satan. <clears throat> Keep in mind, Yeshua said that uh, the, his words aren't his, they're his father's. In verse 28, we, we read earlier, Yeshua therefore said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father has taught me. In John 12, verses 49 and 50, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment, what to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. <clears throat> He's saying that the words come out of my mouth are just the Father's. He's saying he's a prophet like Moses. That's how Moses was too. He had the same thing, the same issue. Elohim put his words in the mouth of Moses. In Exodus 4, verses 12 through 15, Elohim says, Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you're to say. But he said, Please, Master, now send the message by whomever you will. That the anger of Yahweh burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he's coming out to meet you. Then when he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. Once again, Moses was trying to use the excuse, I don't speak Hebrew well. You want me to go speak to the elders? I don't speak Hebrew well. And uh, he says, well, you're Aaron, your brother, the Levite. Yes, he speaks Hebrew well. You've been out of, the, out of town for 40 years. I understand you don't speak it very well. And you spoke Egyptian when you were the, for your first 40 years. Second 40 years, you're in Midian. And then it says, uh, you are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. Then I, even I, will be your mouth and his mouth, and I'll teach you what you're to do. John 8, verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. What are the deeds of Abraham? The Torah. That's it. That's it. Speaking to Isaac. <clears throat> Elohim told Isaac, the son of Abraham, look at verse 24 and 25, I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Verse 40, but as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. This Abraham did not do. You know the old adage, like father, like son? That's what he's saying. Uh, you're not like your father you claim to be. There's something wrong. This doesn't apply to you. If you were really Abraham's son, you wouldn't want to kill me. Verse 41, you're doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even Elohim. Did you catch that again? 
We're not born of fornication. <clears throat> they want to claim Abraham's their father, but Yeshua says he's, he's not their father. Now they want to claim Elohim is their father. Verse 42, Yeshua said to them, If Elohim were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from Elohim. For I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't hear my word. They can't hear it. They, they don't understand his words because they don't know him. They don't fear him. They're not sons of the Father. They're not chosen. All they hear is the Charlie Brown wah, wah, wah. When mom and dad would talk. Psalm 25, verse 14, the secret of Yahweh is for those who fear him. And he'll make them know his covenant. Isn't that interesting? I love that passage. The secret of Yahweh is for those who fear him. He'll make them know his covenant. Psalm 92, verses 5 and 6. How great are your works, O Yahweh! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this. <laughs> Jeremiah 4, verse 22. For my people are foolish, they know me not. They're stupid children. They have no understanding. They're shrewd to do evil. But to do good, they do not know. Going back to John 8, verse 44. You're of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. <clears throat> um, these men were murderers. Um, their father was Satan. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, as he says. In 1 John 3, starting at verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The son of Elohim has appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of Elohim practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of Elohim. By this, the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of Elohim, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous." Notice that it's not possible, as most churches teach, that Satan, Satan was once a perfect angel that fell from grace or whatever nonsense that is. He says Satan was a murderer from when? From the beginning. Yeah. He is what he was made, he, he is what he was made to be. That's what he is. Where do they get that from? Misinterpretations of Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Total misinterpretations, not understanding scriptural symbolism, and try to make Satan out to be, and Satan's not even mentioned, uh, in Isaiah, they inserted the name Lucifer in there. But that's, you know, how that became his name, I have no idea. But uh, it's, they inserted, it's not even in the, the manuscripts at all. But uh, it's just all sad and pathetic. John says they sinned from the beginning. The Pharisees want to do the deeds of their father, Satan. Verses 45 and 46. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? So he's challenging them. What sin did I do? Tell me. And if you don't know of any, why don't you believe me? Especially considering the signs that he's performed right in front of them. Verse 47, he was of Elohim, hears the words of Elohim. For this reason you do, you do not hear them, because you're not of Elohim. They don't understand him because they're not of him. They're not chosen. His people hear his word and abide by it. The first three verses of the Psalms say, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. 
He'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in the season. And its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Verse 48 of John 8. The Jews answered and said to him, Do you not say rightly that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? <laughs> or do we not say rightly that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Why would they accuse him of being a Samaritan? First of all, they can't argue with what he's saying. All they can do is say, no, you're a Samaritan. What, what sin have I committed? You're a Samaritan. And you got a demon. Why would they say he's a Samaritan? Because he stopped and talked to that Samaritan woman. Okay? That's why. Uh, why. Why is that a problem? In John 4, verse 9, the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Okay? You're just a Samaritan. No. But that's all they got. Name calling. Verse 49, Yeshua answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. So the one who keeps his word will not see eternal death. His word is his Torah of his father. Verse 52, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste of death. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Yeshua answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my father who glorifies me. Of whom you say, he is our Elohim. You've not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I, that I don't know him, then I'm a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Yeshua says he truly knows Elohim because he's his father's word that became flesh. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, evidently, Abraham saw the day of Messiah and rejoiced when he did so. Now, I, it doesn't say specifically when he saw that in Genesis. It probably was when he went to sacrifice his son. That's in Genesis 22. Um, and we'll skip through part of it. It came, back at, uh, it came about after these days, Elohim tested Abraham, said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the mouth of uh, the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And skipping down to verse 8. And Abraham said, Elohim will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do not do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear Elohim, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. But Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. Abraham went, took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh will provide, as it is to this day. In the mount of Yahweh it will be provided. And the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. That's likely where he saw the day of Messiah. Yeah. Abraham. Is, yes. Uh, he's a hundred and something. hundred and something. And uh, throughout his life, how, how often? How, the point I'm getting at is, is, is Elohim doesn't speak to you today and tell you something and you right. start under, and grow up and, and sacrifice the son. So he had had interactions for how long would you suppose? Decades. It's decades. So yes. he... He, he already had a relationship with the father to know that he could trust him. Right. Right. He already had that. Yes. But he was still willing to do what he told 
still willing to do. And he was being tested. Yeah, he's being tested. We have to be tried. We have to be tried. Verses 57 and 58, the Jews therefore said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Yeshua said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. See, it's, it's one of the most unmistakable claims of who he is is when he says that, that I am thing. Because when he told Moses to say, I am sent me to you in Exodus 3.14, Verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Yeshua hid himself and went out of the temple. Um, the, the Pharisees immediately wanted to kill him. They considered his words blasphemy. They wanted him gone anyway because he was going against them. Their, their power base was deteriorating. This was hurting them bad. But they considered his words blasphemy. Leviticus 26, verse 14 says, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. His time had not yet come. They couldn't get to him. His escape was probably supernatural in some way. We're not given details. <clears throat> the public pronouncement of being Elohim was what the Pharisees were waiting for, because he's saying that. They thought they had their excuse to kill him then. It says Yeshua hid from them, and we're not told how he did this, but the Pharisees right now, they're out for blood, and they're moving forward. Any questions, any thoughts on uh, John chapter 8? John has all kinds of good stuff in it. Power base, their position, yeah. They'll do anything to, yep. You can see the nature of man out in these Pharisees, really. <clears throat> Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for your word as always um, and for, your, for us to uh, be privileged to be a part of your appointed times. And uh, Father, they are truly a blessing to us. And may Yahweh bless us and keep us. And may Yahweh make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon us and give us shalom. Amen.